Hey, good morning. Welcome to Sonoma Valley Church of the Nazarene. Thank you for joining me today. Today, we're going to be looking at a story that's very familiar to most of us. It's the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. It's a story that, as familiar as it is, I think we often get so very wrong. And before we begin, I've got a little video that I want us to look at. It's a little longer than we probably need, but I think you'll agree that it's totally worth it. Chanda, what do you want to be when you grow up as a grown man? An actor and an artist. An actor in motion pictures? Yeah. Let me give you a little test. Have you ever done any acting? Yeah. Well, try it. Say Art Linkletter like you're mad. Art Linkletter like you're mad. <laughs> What do you think you'll be when you grow up? A bus driver or a pilot. A bus driver or a pilot? Yes. Well, suppose you were a pilot on a big airplane and suddenly all four engines stopped right away. What would you say? Our father would turn to everybody. Who's the most important man in the world today, in your opinion? George Washington. George Washington. That's right. He's married, isn't he? Yes, sir. Do you know who his wife is? Miss America. That's... I'll bet you before you came down here, they all gave you orders today, didn't they? Very important before you come on a coast-to-coast -coast show. Paula Brown, what did your parents tell you? Um, to keep my legs together. <laughs> How does that story go? One time there was God, and God made Adam out of dust. And then he put Adam to sleep and made Eve out of a rare rib. And then Out of God, what kind of a rib? Rare. A rare rib. <laughs> God said, Adam and Eve, don't eat the apple tree or I'll punish you. And then the devil came along and hip, kind of hypnotized them. <laughs> and then God went to see someone. And then they got real sick. And then they, and then they hided, then they hided from God. And they threw up. <laughs> Who took the first bite? And then Eve, then Eve. And Eve, um... Boy, I bet God was mad. Yeah, then God sent them to hell, and they transferred on to, um, Los Angeles. <laughs> we learned from this that all Adam and Eve have a, had a whole mess of baby. <laughs> How did God punish Eve? Well, um, he made Adam... Um, sit down and read the Bible. Boy, that was, uh, write the Bible. He sat down and wrote the Bible. Yeah. What did he do with Eve? He made her what? Oh, a housewife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess my work here is done. We've been working our way through the book of Genesis, and these pages in Scripture are among the most widely read, but also the most deeply misunderstood than any in the entire book of Scripture. Genesis, or the Book of Origins, is a carefully crafted theological, not scientific, description of God's creation and ordering of the cosmos. But we also need to remember that these sacred texts were written to an ancient culture some 4,000 years ago. And so we need to put away our Protestant, modern, post-Enlightenment mindset and try to think like the people to whom it was written. And it's helpful when we realize that these people didn't have a modern scientific orientation. And so the prophets often spoke to God's people by use of story. Let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at our passage together. Lord God, we come to you today, as always, inviting you to be in our presence, asking you, Lord, to be our teacher. We pray as we open up these sacred texts today that you would help us understand what it is that we are to understand about you and your character and your nature. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles with you, turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, where we read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the one in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, when the woman saw the fruit, that it was good for food and that it was pleasing to the eye and that it was desirable for obtaining uh, wisdom, she took some and she ate. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And then they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said, where are you? And he answered, I heard you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree in which I commanded you not to? And the man said, the woman who you put here with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above the li all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children and your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to your wife and ate from the fruit of the tree in which I commanded you not to eat, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground from which you came. For from dust you came and to dust you will return. And Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and for his wife, and he clothed them. And then the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good from evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so the Lord God banished him from the garden to work in the ground from which he came. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden a cherubim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord to you. Thanks be to God. Well, as you can see from the video that we watched earlier, what these children understood about this story was that a mean, angry, and demanding God banished Adam and Eve for their disobedience and then kicked them out of the beautiful garden that he had created for them. Now, in truth, I think they came by this opinion honestly. I think this is how many of us actually learn this story. But let's investigate a little bit further. <clears throat> the book of Genesis begins by God creating order out of chaos with beauty and goodness so that life can flourish. Then God makes these creatures that he calls humans and he makes them in his own image and he gives them a role and a purpose in his good creation. Humans are made to be a reflection of God's character and appointed to be God's uh, caretakers on his behalf. And God blesses these humans and gives them a garden in which they can start building this world. Now, the key to this story is that the humans now have a choice of how they're going to go about building this world. And this plays its, its way out in the, knowledge, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Up until now, God had decided what was good and what was not good. But now God is giving the humans the dignity and the freedom of choice. And this freedom and this choice comes with an element of risk. Are the humans going to return God's love and trust him and trust his definition of good and evil? Or will they go about defining for themselves what is good and true and right? Now, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil need a little bit of an explanation. The tree of life represents God's own life and creative power that's available to others. And the, and the fact is, is that God commanded that all the humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. And that the one who eats from this tree will live forever. The only tree that was prohibited to eat from was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's also beautiful in, in its appearance, 
but its appearance is deceiving. It represents taking the authority to do what is right and good in your own mind. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, to violence, and to death. And the stakes are really high, because to turn away from God is to embrace death, since God is the author and the giver of life. Now in chapter 3, a mysterious creature enters the story. The snake is given no introduction, other than that he's a creature that God made. And it becomes clear that this is a creature who is actively in rebellion against God, and who wants to lead the humans into rebellion with him. The snake tells a different story about the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. This is the first example in the Bible of fake news. The snake tells the woman that the fruit of the tree is not going to bring death, but it's actually going to bring life, and that you will become like God themselves. But here's the crazy part. They are already like God. This is tragic because they're already made in the image of God. And instead of trusting God, they seize autonomy for themselves. And they take the fruit of the tree, and in an instant, the whole story begins to spiral out of control. And the first casualty in our story involves human relationships. The man and the woman realize that they are naked and how vulnerable they are, and they can't even trust each other, and so they hide their bodies from one another. And the second casualty is the intimacy between God and humans is lost. They run and they hide from God. And when he finds them, they start pointing fingers at each other and blaming each other about who was the first one to rebel. And then there's a break in the story where God explains to the snake and to the humans the, the tragic consequences of their actions. God first tells the snake that in spite of his apparent victory, his, he is destined to eat dust. And he promises that a one day a descendant will come from the seed of the woman that will deliver a lethal blow to the, snake, to the snake's head. And this lethal blow will come at a cost, because the snake, too, will deliver a lethal blow to the descendant's heel as it's being crushed. But what's obvious in this story so far is that this is not an angry, demanding God pitching a fit because his humans are disobedient. We see a God who has always acted on our behalf, who is created for the object of his affection, who is always had our best interests at heart. And his banishment from the garden is not some kind of punishment, but it's an act of God's mercy and God's grace. But it doesn't erase the consequences of their decisions. And so God informs them that every aspect of their lives will now come with hardship and grief and sometimes pain because of their rebellion, all leading to death. But there is a plan. And there's one more thing that, that God does on our behalf, and that is to make sure that we can't get to the tree of life until God's plan is fully implemented. And so, so that we don't live forever in an estranged relationship with our creator. And something else that's amazing comes from the prediction of the woman's seed crushing the snake's head, even though he would return a lethal blow himself. The event foretells God's plan of salvation that comes by way of the cross. In this historical event, God's own son becomes the wounded victor over sin and death, providing a way to a restored life with God once again. And this is where our passage ends for today. And what we will see as the chapters continue is the con that consequences uh, for their actions result in consequences. And these consequences in our tradition we call sin, which is a word that nobody really likes. But sin really is simply a matter of distorting God's truth, God's beauty, or God's justice all of which results in broken relationships, violence, and in death. This is probably a good place to, to call it quits for today. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, we are so grateful that you are not a harsh, angry, and capricious God, but that you are a good, faithful, and just God who is worthy of our trust. We are thankful that you have entrusted us with the dignity and the freedom of choice, and I pray that all those who hear this message today will choose life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you join me for one final song before we close?
just one thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that in the power of the Holy Spirit you might abound in love. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. Go in peace.